Yeah, let's talk about the, the, the oils one because I think I, I think the eating behavior is is interesting and I see it see you know definite advantages to the diet. But I mean, because because that's a that's a question that I have and I, I've looked a little you know a little bit into the research uh, and seeing that those oxidative oxidized oils do seem to hang around and be problematic. And I don't know what you have dug up on that. Yeah. So so here's the thing: is for a long time I used to believe that omega six fats were inherent inherently inflammatory. And now I don't, because if we actually look, there's studies of supplementing with arachidonic acid and this kind of thing that actually shows that it actually enhances muscle bulk and muscle strength. And they're actually, they don't appear to be negative in the right situation. And the right situation is a low inflammatory environment. So the problem with omega-6s or the problem with our old thinking was that we thought you ingest this omega-6 fat and then it gets turned into arachidonic acid. And then that arachidonic acid can be turned into these inflammatory products um, downstream. But the key thing is to understand is that arachidonic acid is not converted into these inflammatory products in the absence of an inflammatory stimulus. So if you're in a low inflammatory state, your arachidonic acid is just sitting there and it can produce good things, but it won't produce these bad things. And in actual fact, when we put people, there's one study I know of that actually looked at arachidonic acid levels on a low carb diet, which we know is a low inflammation diet. And they actually found that arachidonic acid levels increased. And that fully supports this view that there's less conversion of arachidonic acid into these negative products. And the reason that all these vegetable and seed oils are associated with bad health is not in essence because they're high in omega-6, it's because they're high in oxidized products. So when you have any fat, for it to be liquid, it has to have double bonds between carbons. The more double bonds, the more liquid it is. So basically the liquidity or solidity of a fat is, a, is proportional and a good surrogate marker for how saturated or unsaturated it is. And any fat that has these double bonds between carbons is prone to oxidation. And that can be omega-3 fats just as much as omega-6 fats. And this is critical to understand because people supplementing with fish oil, they're not necessarily doing themselves a service. And they did a study a couple of years back in Australia. So went around to two different pharmacies in Sydney, local here, and bought all the available uh, fish oil supplements that didn't have additives to them and measured their oxidation state. And every single one of them had a, uh, was oxidized. And they measured it called something called TOTOX or total oxidation. And the range was between 10, which I consider still too high, and 133. So fish oil is not safe. So the, the premise is that if you want to avoid oxidized fats, then you better get it from food. Because the definition of oxidized fats in food is rancidity. If you are not going to eat something that's rancid, then you're probably not going to be ingesting high levels of oxidized fats. So if you want your omega-3s, have some salmon that's not rotten have some grass-fed beef that's, you know, that's fresh. So, and you'll also get your omega-6s this way as well. And the problem is that when we ingest, say, if we have a vegetable or seed oil, this just forms the largest part of oils in our diet, and that's why we get most of these oxidized products. They get absorbed through our chylomicrons. They attack the liver. So we've got good evidence in mice where they've done electron microscopy and they can actually see scarring and damage of liver cells after their ingestion of oxidized products. We know these oxidized products can be incorporated into LDL particles, which then becomes atherogenic and has the capacity to cause heart disease and uh, issues with that. And we also know that these oils are oxidized incredibly quickly. So even within a matter of hours, there was one paper I read on walnut oil, and I think it was tested six hours after harvest. It already had significant amounts of oxidation. So even if you're buying, you know, single press extra virgin olive oil that's kept in a cool cupboard that's in a brown jar, it's not going to be enough. It's still going to be oxidized. And olive oil is something that surprises a lot of people. Remember we said it's oil is liquid because it's got a double bond? Well, 70% of olive oil is oleic acid or omega-9 which has a single double bond, and that double bond is still prone to oxidation. So even olive oil doesn't get a pass. So if you want to uh, work out what the safest oil is to have, or safest fat, well, the basic thing is it should be solid at room temperature. 
The more solid it is, that's a really good surrogate marker for the less double bonds, less prone to oxidation. And one more key point here is you have to strictly control your blood sugar levels. I did a study looking at uh, oxidized oil intake and how much was actually taken up into the body in a group of well-controlled diabetics and poorly controlled diabetics and healthy people. And what they actually found is that the level of oxidized products that ended up in your system in the poorly controlled diabetics was significantly greater, order of magnitude greater than in people who were either well controlled or didn't have diabetes in the first place. And we know this makes sense because fluctuations in your blood sugar levels actually does gener generate oxidative stress within the mitochondria. So we've got evidence of this as well. So what I'm now recommending for my patients is that they avoid any liquid fat, They're including fish oil. And if they want to make sure they get the fish oil, it's got to be from fresh food. And that includes not having olive oil. And if they still are having any oils at all, it's absolutely essential that they have strict blood sugar control. Is there any, what, 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 what issues would there be from getting the oils from like the whole food, like salmon, but you're like grilling it at a higher temperature? Is that a problem too then? Or is it, is it somehow different at that point? Look, we can hypothesize there's been no studies that I've read that look at the specific nature of oxidation of all the fat. So we know that, you know, theoretically you get, uh, you know, production of some chemicals that are not so good when you, you basically burn proteins and you overcook them. Um, whether you're cooking it on a, you know, a moist heat or a high heat, I haven't read the specific research. I, I would suggest that you don't want to overcook them but I don't have, I can't reference any papers specifically that tells you it's a bad idea. Certainly for me, I eat a lot of red meat and a lot of that is medium rare. So, um, and I'm comfortable with that. 